It's good to see you all today. How's everybody doing? Good, good. We're starting a new series this morning called, as you can see from the screen, The Definition Deception. Pretty obvious, as you all know, as we go through life, we define things. I was thinking about kind of how this works, watching children grow up and the definitions that they give to things. You know, you, you see as a child for the very first time a puppy, because every kid should have a puppy, right? Raise your hand if you like puppies. Everybody likes puppies. Yeah. And so, um, <laughs> so you see a puppy for the first time and as a little child and it's, it's warm and it's soft and it kind of licks your face and it barks and it kind of has that puppy smell. And, and you begin to define that even as a tiny little child. You look at that thing and you say, oh, you know, this puppy, is, it's nice. It's, it's a good thing. It's fun. It, I like how it is. And you have definition for it. It's good. That's good. That's how you define it. It's good. On the other hand, if you see a cat, <laughs> you have other definitions. Some we probably shouldn't say in this setting. But uh, you, anybody cat people out there? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, my first experience of cats, the, the two things that came to my mind were, in my, the way I defined cats as a little boy was smells bad, really bad, and claws. Those things have claws. And they didn't mind using them. And as a little kid, I always had these claw marks from our cat. It was my brother's cat. Its name was Herman. Herman the cat. And I think my brother taught it how to attack me and hurt me. So uh, I don't have positive definitions about cats. But, you know, we define everything. We look at this, we say, that's good, that's bad. We see a movie, I like it, I don't like it. It was funny, it was silly, it was this, it was that. We define things. But the interesting thing here is, is that how this kind of works in a much more personal way is that as we go through life, every single person, man, woman, child on this planet, as we live, we begin to pick up definitions about ourselves. Ways we define ourselves. And those definitions come primarily from two places. They come from the experiences that we have, and usually beginning as very, very small children. And they come from what other people think about us, or at least what we think other people think about us. If they think something positive about us, they say something positive, we might pick that up and begin to define ourselves in that way. You know, I'm a, I'm a good baseball player or something like that. You know, a six-year-old can catch and can hit. And dad says, wow, you're great, son. You're really good. And coach says, you're really good. And they get a definition. I'm a good baseball player. And so sometimes these definitions that we carry are positive. But the truth is, most of the time, they're pretty negative definitions. Being small, we have experiences, things happen, people in our lives aren't always very loving, not like maybe we wish they would be. We have things that happen as we go through life, and we begin to pick up definitions of ourselves, and we carry these definitions for our whole lives. I was born into a family of three older brothers. Can you imagine? Three-year-old one of them with a really mean cat. I don't know if I pointed that out already. And my brothers, uh, you know, it just it's how it works that when you're the new kid on the block, and this is true if you're new at you're the new kid at the school, or you're the new kid at you know, new person at a job or whatever, the people who have been there have a well sort of defined pecking order, you know? And you come in and you're at the very bottom of that thing. And they're going to have opinions and attitudes and things about you, partly because you step in and you change the whole dynamic. You're the new person in the job. People are going to be watching you, and they're going to make assessments. They're going to define you. She's a good worker. She's not a good worker. She's pretty smart. She's not. She's nice. She's not nice. You know, they're going to have these definitions about you. And as an adult, you can kind of categorize these things. You can say, well, they think this. They're just, you know, they're jealous. Or they, they don't really know me yet. And when they see what a good worker I am, they're going to totally change their mind or whatever. You know, we have categories. But as a child, we don't have categories when people begin to define us. So I'm born into a family of three older brothers, four of us all together. 
and the, the, you know, the dynamic was well established. And so as I came into the family and started just being a, a little child, uh, that caused some stuff. And I can remember events where one particular event, I was probably maybe three, and uh, one of my older brothers, and I should tell you, I have a wonderful family, but one of my older brothers and my mom started kind of goofing around as sons and moms will do, and I sort of stepped in, and when I jumped in, I just got excited about it, you know, as a little kid, and, and when I stepped in, I distinctly remember them stopping what they're doing, and my brother just looking at me and going, and walking away. And so these events happened a lot as a child. And so as they started happening more and more as a little child, I didn't have any way to categorize what was happening. I began to get a definition. And this definition was how I understood myself as a three or four year old child. And that definition was, I ruined things. And that's the definition that stayed with me. There was this great family. I stepped into the family and as I did, I ruined things. And so I learned as a little child that it was better to stay away from the family a little bit. That when they were together, I should keep my distance just a little bit. That I should avoid my brothers just a little bit. And when they were doing things, they were having fun, I should stay a little at the distance. Because I was the one in the whole family of six that ruined things. That was the definition I, I had. Now, these sorts of definitions stay with you. And as I uh, grew, I began school. Now, I only remember three things about the, the kindergarten, going into kindergarten. I remember making this life-sized uh, painting of myself, finger painting. I'm sure it was like Rembrandt. I'm sure it was beautiful. Uh, my mom threw it away immediately. Um, so I remember that. I, uh, I remember the teacher, who was like 150 years old, I think, uh, telling me to go get scissors. The whole class was sitting there, and I went and I got scissors, and I carried them just the way she said. And as I walked with the scissors, she said, now look at how Kevin's carrying that scissors. That's how I want you all to do it. And I felt so wonderful because of everyone in the kindergarten, I was the best scissor carrier there was. And that was, by the way, my one accomplishment in all of 13 years of public school. And so I carry those scissors. The other thing I remember that stands out very clearly is that for one day, I was the coolest kid in the kindergarten with all the boys because they thought I kissed a little girl named Teresa. And so they, they, I was like the hero of the kindergartner kids. So kindergarten was pretty good. And, uh, you know, I just kind of went through. And then I hit the first grade. In the first grade, I had a brand new teacher. I'll never forget her. She seemed like she was six miles tall. Her name was Miss Long. And being in class with Miss Long was a kind of a challenge because, you know, and I'm sure there are many teachers that their first year is pristine, but Miss Long had some, some stuff going on. And one day, Miss Long, uh, for whatever reasons, I don't know why, called me up front in front of the class. Now, you know, you already are pretty insecure when you're six years old in the first grade and um, kind of can have some anxiety and feel pretty nervous about that. You know, we, we really are like sponges for definitions at that age. You know, we get a little crusty when we hit, you know, kind of middle age and stuff and we learn to build a really hard barrier and shell so that no one can hurt us. But as a child, you don't. You're just, you're, you're a sponge for definitions and for wanting to know what people think. And, and you don't even know you're doing that, but you are. And especially people that you consider to be experts, authorities on things. So Mrs. Long, Ms. Long called me up in front of the whole class. And she, uh, she had me bring my classwork up. And as I stood next to her in front of the class, she held up my classwork. And she said, I want everyone to look at this. Now, you remember the scissors, the good scissors carrying her. Didn't go that way. She held up my homework or my classwork. She said, I want you all to look at what Kevin did. This is absolutely wrong. Do not do what he did. And then she gave me my work and sent me to sit down. So that began to help me kind of formulate another definition. It's amazing the power of people we consider to be authorities. And that definition was that I was bad at school. So when I thought about myself from kindergarten or for first grade all the way till I graduated 12th grade, 
I was the person, I was the kid in the class who was bad at school. I couldn't do school. And what that meant was a couple of things. One, it meant that I just didn't see a point of even trying because I'd probably fail anyway. So I didn't try. And when I did kind of try, I really hadn't done the, the prep I needed, and so I'd get a bad grade or whatever. I'd fail. I wouldn't do good on tests because I didn't try. And so it was sort of this self-fulfilling prophecy. Well, I'm not, not going to do I'm bad at school. And so why try? Because I'm not going to do well, so I do try. I get a bad grade because I'm not really trying like I need to. And that just confirms to me what Miss Long said. I'm just bad at school. Even classes I remember in high school, stuff I wanted to try, I decided I won't try because I'll fail anyway. So I'll, I'll just make it as easy as I can on myself. I'll get out of school. I'll, I'll graduate somehow, you know, get a job, bribe the teachers if I have to with my money. You know, I'll figure out a way and I'll get out of school because I'm bad at school. And that stayed with me till the day I graduated. Now, the thing about that is that when you are bad at school and, and you, in your mind, everybody else is good, and you have an authority that tells you you're bad at school, that begins to form other definitions in your mind. Other definitions begin to come to you. This is very common, that we start with one, and then we take the next step and assign a definition to myself. I define myself by what's happening, my experiences, and by what I think other people think. And so since school is a place of learning and academia and the smart kids do well, then I got a definition that was more of kind of a general thing. And I began to define myself simply as stupid. I was just stupid. I, I could do good at school. I didn't know anything. And, you know, I had three older brothers who were willing to confirm how stupid I was. You know, stupid, period. Stupid. And so, for me, it seemed like the best hope I had in life was to figure out some way to get through school, which I barely did, and uh, figure out a way to get a job and do something. I didn't know what, but it wasn't just that then that I felt like I was bad at. If I was stupid, I was stupid. So I wanted to be very careful about what I said to people. I wanted to be careful about how I acted. And in fact, the reality is, began to build up a lot of anxiety where I quite honestly just don't want to be around people. I wanted to keep my distance because if you already are defining yourself in this way, you don't need more confirmation that you are this way. Now that's part of my story. But I, I tell you that because I know that all of us could hold up cards right now and say, well, I've defined myself like that. This happened when I was a kid, and, you know, or maybe this series of events happened, and, you know, these, these negative things, or people said this, or for whatever reasons, and, and I define myself like this. I'm just talking to my kids this week. Even one of them, I said... Um, he saw the signs, and he said, well, Dad, you're not stupid. <laughs> and I said, well, I thought I was. And I said, and you know, you have definitions of yourself, too. And we talked a little bit about some of those definitions he's picked up, and he just kind of dropped his head, and I said, that's what you think, isn't it? I said, yeah. And I said, but you know, it's not true, right? And he's all, you know. So somebody can tell you it's not true, but, but we pick these things up, and we believe they're true, and because of, of how we define ourselves, it just stays with us. Now, these things affect us in a couple of ways. Write this down if you want. The first way these definitions affect us, obviously, is they, they have a major impact on us by how they make us feel about ourselves. How we feel about ourselves. It is a thought, I define myself as this, and then a feeling follows that. And usually the feeling can be something like bad. I'm just bad. Or it can be something like, well, I'm just, in, you know, just not good enough. So I'm defective, broken. You know, I, I watched uh, my own mom as she, she had a, a heart attack when she was in her late 70s and it, it had a massive brain damage. 
And so a lot of stuff that she had held for almost 80 years, uh, and she was terribly abused as a child, just began to spill out of her. And it was pretty obvious that she had carried these definitions, things she'd probably gotten from a little child uh, that stayed with her until really the day we, that she passed away. And I remember I would go to visit her and I would say, Mom, how are you doing? And she'd say, oh, mean as ever. It's mean as ever. Mean as ever. And it just broke my heart to hear that because I recognized that was a definition she'd been carrying probably since she was a little girl. When her mom would lock her in the closet and scream obscenities at her and, and call her names and call her, I mean, whore. That was one of my grandmother's favorite names for my mother's little girl. Such a whore. Such a whore. And she would call her, you know, just so mean-spirited. You don't do anything around this house, blah, blah, blah. You know, type of thing. And so that was a definition that stayed with her. And it made her feel like a bad person her whole life. And that's just how they work. They affect how I feel about myself. Another way that they have a major impact on us is, is how we view the whole world around us. If I have positive definitions, if, if I live in maybe a little more light, a little more truth, then how I define myself is a little more positive, then how I see the world is a little more positive. But if it's the other way, then how I see the world is going to be a little more negative. It's a scary place. It's a bad place. Um, you know, that's going to come out in how I talk about the people around me. And I don't know if, if you all have noticed this, but just in my lifetime, the United States has become one of those negative places around. I mean, it just seems like everybody is critical of something and like violently critical of, of stuff around them. You know, we, we, we have no end of the negative things that we tend to say. And what it does is it makes us all kind of nervous. It, it makes us feel kind of like we're in an unsafe place. Well, where does all that pessimism and negativism come from? Well, my belief is it stems back largely about how we feel about ourselves. Because the average child, you know, six, seven, eight years old, is getting hundreds of and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of messages throughout the week. Not just from family and from school and friends and teachers and, and uh, Sunday school teachers and whatever. But also from the media that's telling them, that's giving definitions. You're good if you do this. Well, how do I do this? Well, you got to buy our product. You know, the whole, the whole advertising thing. You're, you know, you're not cool unless you do this. You know, I remember being in seventh grade. My math teacher, who was... Uh, it's a very interesting person. Uh, someone asked her, do you smoke? And she said, oh, no, no, I don't smoke. I don't smoke at all. Okay? Um, and the, the, this is two girls talking to her. And the girl said, well, do you drink? And she said, well, of course I drink. I don't want to be a square. And it kind of logged into my 13-year-old mind at the time that her whole, you know, and I'm just a kid, and she's an adult, but her whole perception is that if she doesn't drink, she's going to be a square. Now, in the class, we had all kinds of ways of defining her square. wasn't one of them. But do you see how we get definitions based on our society? And your kids are getting millions of messages a year that are telling them what they're supposed to do so that they can have a positive definition about themselves. Millions of messages. We all handle this differently, but uh, the way my wife and I have handled it is decided to try and keep those messages from coming in completely. You know, I mean, the best we can. We just, we limit media a lot. So that's just kind of how that works. How I define myself is how I'll view the world around me. Now, another thing that you probably know is another way these, these definitions impact us is how I treat other people. I'm going to treat other people positively or negatively based on how I'm feeling about myself. I'm just going to respond based on what I feel about myself. I have a friend who uh, had this little puppy. Remember I said dogs were good, cats, but um, had this little, this dog. And this dog, he was, he was 10 years old, so he was his very best friend in the world. He loved this dog. They went every place together and had a lot of fun together, you know, just boy and his dog type of thing. And one day they were outside playing. The dog ran on the street. A car hit. 
and he was horrified as a little boy. And he did what anyone would do. He ran to pick the dog up to help it. And when he reached for the dog, the dog snapped at him and started growling. You know, started showing its teeth and stuff. And he couldn't figure out why this dog that, you know, was, he loved to death, and the dog apparently loved him to death, was trying to chew his hand off. And then he began to understand, and this stayed with him as an adult. When something's feeling a lot of pain and trauma, it strikes out, even if someone's trying to help it. That's how it works. We don't know when we're feeling trauma or anxiety where the pain's coming from or where it's going to stop, what's causing it, or when it's going to stop. If we pick up definitions that make us feel a general sense of pain, a negativity about ourselves then that's going to come out toward other people. And I'm going to treat other people based on the definitions I've picked up about myself. And then you treat them bad, and that makes them to respond bad towards you, and back and forth it goes. How I treat other people is going to be based on this. And the fourth way it impacts you. <coughs> Excuse me. The fourth way that this impacts us is by what I'm willing to try. What I'm willing to try. If I've been told, for instance, in my story, I've, I've got a definition in first grade that I'm bad at school, that I'm not going to be willing to try school. If you are, uh, you know, you're a little girl and you're doing dance class and your parents come to your first recital, which, you know, I mean, you're practically tripping over your own feet, but your parents pat you on the back and say, that was really good. And your dance teacher says, I'm so proud of you. That's going to make you want to try more. They're beginning to define you in positive ways. If, however, you do your dance presentation, your parents obviously are embarrassed about what you're doing. And they tell you, you need to work harder. And the other girls were doing so much better. That's going to put in your mind a definition, I'm not good at dancing. And you're going to now limit yourself from doing that. These things limit us. And as I said, they cause a lot of pain. Now, I want to read a couple of scriptures to you because this, the Bible speaks about this kind of stuff a lot. It speaks a lot about the definitions we give ourselves. And it talks about how they impact us and how this really kind of makes us feel on the inside, what this does to us. Look at this out of the book of Proverbs. All these are out of Proverbs. Let's see it up on the screen. A happy heart makes the face cheerful, but heartache crushes the spirit. Show you another one. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. You know, it's interesting that uh, physicians for a long time have recognized the power of stress on our physical health. And so I don't think this is just a, a, a sort of a metaphor, sort of a, a figure of speech when it says it dries up the bones, although it is that. I think really what, what he's saying here is that it has an actual physical impact on our health if we define ourselves in negative ways. Let me give you a third one. A man's spirit sustains him in sickness, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? Who can bear? And you know, we, uh, we all know and unfortunately, social media has really, uh, really made this quite a bit worse. I told you about all the messages, the millions of messages kids get every, every year through a million different ways. And one of those ways, of course, is social media, the Facebooks, the stuff like that. And we've all heard and read about the stories of the, you know, the beautiful, wonderful 15-year-old girl who, because the other kids are harassing her so much and defining her in so many bizarre ways, or maybe she does something really stupid because she needs to feel loved. She takes a naked picture of herself and shoots it to her idiot boyfriend, who, you know, 16-year-old is now going to post it for all of his friends to see, and suddenly, you know, 7 billion people have access to her picture naked. And she's so humiliated because she did a really dumb thing. And all of a sudden, everybody starts defining her as a certain kind of person that she decides she can't live with the pain anymore based on their definitions. And of course, she's proved it by the stupid thing she's done in her mind. And so she decides it's easier to just end her own life. 
than to live with, with the pain of that. So here's what I want to say today about definitions, because I'm aware every one of you has definitions. Every person who lives has definitions. Sometimes they're deep and we don't even know it. But we have these, these definitions that we live with. So I want you to know a couple of things about it. Again, you can jot this down if you want to. First thing I want you to know about these definitions is that quite honestly, quite honestly, they are almost always very inaccurate. Very inaccurate. We feel they're true. And other people or experiences may confirm that they're true. But in reality, they are usually very inaccurate. Not just inaccurate, very inaccurate. I had a friend, uh, a man quite a bit older than I was, about my dad's age, really. Um, and he was, uh, he was one of those guys that's easy to look up to. You know what I mean? He uh, had served in uh, World War II in the Navy and uh, honorably discharged before that as a, as a young man. He'd had all these adventures, you know, these different things he had done, and a pretty brave, courageous guy. He'd accomplished a lot after the war. He'd gotten uh, married, actually during the war he'd gotten married. He raised a family. All of his children were successful, are successful. He had run two successful businesses, sold them, made a lot of money. And when he passed away, uh, I was talking with his wife about him. And I said, you know, he was just sincerely a great, great man. And she said, oh, he was, wasn't he? Oh, he absolutely was. And of course, she had a lot of praise for him. She said, but you know what? He always felt, and he would always tell me, that he just was not successful. Just not successful. And it always made him feel so bad about himself. Now, he was successful. His definition was very inaccurate. By everything we would measure success in our world, even the love in his family. He was very successful. But somewhere, he picked up the definition that he was not a successful kind of person, not a person who could even maintain success. And so he lived his whole successful, wonderful life feeling negative that he wasn't successful and went to his grave with that definition, not all of the accomplishments, that definition in his mind, not successful. And you know, your definitions for yourself, those negative, pessimistic ones that you maybe have, those are probably very inaccurate. Very inaccurate. Now, a second thing about them is that they are always misleading. They're misleading. You know, my definition of being bad at school led me in the direction of thinking, well, I must be stupid. And that caused a lot of how I lived from that point on. A lot of how I viewed the world, how I treated people, what I was willing to try, a lot of how I lived. They, they lead us in the wrong direction. They're misleading. They take us away from the truth, but th not just that they're not accurate, it's that they actually cause us to go in another direction. You know what's interesting? The teacher who sort of helped me get that definition, now I have probably twice the education she had. Do you realize that? Probably twice the education she ever got. Academically, I'm miles and miles and miles beyond where she ever was. The definition was very inaccurate, but it was also very, very misleading to bring me to a place to the time I graduated from high school of thinking, I better just not try. I better just not try. And in fact, some people even understand that this misleading aspect of definitions is intentional. That there's an aspect about it in which it's really meant to be deceptive, to keep us from the truth. There's a psychologist, he's passed away now, named David Siemens. And I want to read a quote to you from him. He's written a lot of books. One of them, the, his classic book is just called The Healing of Emotions. But Siemens says this. You can see it on the screen if you want. He says, Satan's greatest psychological weapon, now get this, is a gut level, 
meaning sometimes it's hard to even explain, a gut level feeling of inferiority, inadequacy, and low self worth. So Seaman's whole belief is that the way Satan works is not by saying, hey, come over here, you can you know, do all these bad things, you know, sort of the devil made me do it kind of thing. But that the way Satan works is much more covert, much more, much more evil, much more, much more gut level, to use his phrase, to just get us to believe that what is not true about us is really true. I'm incompetent. I'm inferior. I'm defective. You know, in a phrase that I've heard a, a, many people say, I'm just not good enough. They're misleading. Final thing, you can jot this down if you want. Third thing you should know about these definitions that we have for ourselves, and I really want this to sit in, is that these definitions are never God's opinion. Right. Never God's opinion. God has his own definitions. In fact, next week we're going to talk about God's dictionary. And the way that God defines you and defines me, the way he defines things around us. Now, most of us, because our definitions for ourselves tend to be fairly negative, we apply that to God and believe his definitions for us are pretty negative. But I want to just show you this uh, just one, one statement out of the scripture. It's out of Psalm 139, and it's kind of a cool psalm. It's written by a guy who is understanding in sort of very clear, accurate ways God's perceptions about him personally, but it would apply to every one of us. And it's a long, about 25 verses, I think, but I just pulled one verse out. It just says this, the, the psalmist is talking, or maybe singing, it might be in song, song form, and he says, I praise you, talking to God, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. What are, what are the works he's talking about? Himself. Your works are wonderful. Now, this is not a guy standing in the mirror while he's shaving going, still got it, still got it, yeah, I still got it. This is someone understanding how God takes care and love and nurture for every human being that comes onto the face of this Works are wonderful. I know that full well. Imagine that same 15-year-old who was ridiculed by her friends mercilessly on Facebook who decided to take her life. If somehow, some way, someone could have helped her say that definition that you're a slut, that all the girls at school are saying, and when you walk down the hall they say that, and now it's all on Facebook, that definition, that's not accurate. That's not accurate at all. I don't care what you posted yourself. Okay, you're 15. You know, brain's still forming maybe. I don't know. But, sorry, 15-year-olds. Take that back. But, but that's not true about you. You did what you did for reasons. And those reasons are deep-seated reasons. But that's, it's not accurate. It's not accurate. And now that it's led you to think your life's not worth living, that you're the girl that, that doesn't deserve to live, that's totally misleading. That's, that's actually just the very opposite. And in fact, you know what? What God would say about you when he looks at you is none of that stuff. He doesn't even think on those terms. When he looks at you, what, what he would say as, as he looks at you is wonderful. That'd be his definition for you. If you want to you wanna hold up a plaque, don't hold up the one all your friends are saying. Hold up the one God says, which would just simply be a word, wonderful. You're just wonderful. When God looks at you, regardless of what you've done, regardless of what people are saying, regardless of what maybe your parents who are shamed by you are saying or whatever, regardless of, of everything that have put these definitions in your brain, just hold up what God says. It says wonderful. What would have happened if somehow somebody could have convinced her of that reality? What would have happened? And that's a question I have for all of us. What would happen in your life if somehow you could be convinced that the definitions you carry about yourself, and I know as a pastor I've heard thousands, I guess, you know? I'm no good at relationships, that's one I hear a lot. 
I just, I'm not worthy even of a relationship. I hear that one. I just, I'm not good enough. I hear that one all, all the time. I've said that one a lot. I'm just not good enough. Not smart enough. Not this enough. Not that enough. Or too much. I'm just, you know, I, I just, I'm not, I'm not attractive. I'm an ugly person. And I know I'm an ugly person. You know? And that's why I'll never probably be loved type of thing. And we kind of hear that and we go, well, that's a bizarre. But that's what we all carry, those kind of definitions. What would happen if we could be convinced that those were, were lies, in effect, and could begin to believe what God says, knowing that he's really the authority, isn't he? Not a first-grade school teacher. God's really the authority. God really knows what's going on. But see, the bottom line is, no matter what anybody said, no matter even what we see God saying in the scripture, I have to make a choice. And that choice is, will I just go ahead and believe the garbage that I've picked up in life? Or will I take the risk to believe what God says and begin to live in what God says? One of them leads to unbelievable, wonderful stuff. You know where the other one. I want to pray for you guys right now. And uh, we're going gonna, gonna to close. Tim is going to uh, close with some music at the end. But after I pray, you guys are uh, dismissed. You can go. If you want to come down and, and uh, talk or pray, we can do that. We're going to talk about the, the definition deception for two more weeks because it's so important that we learn how to define ourselves in truthful ways because it makes all the difference in the world for us. So uh, would you just stand and, and let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. And we thank you that uh, regardless of the stuff that we pick up in this world, regardless of what we think all of our experiences prove about who we are or what we are or our value or anything else, regardless of all of that, that you, in fact, hold the truth. You hold the reality of who we are and of what we are and of the value we possess. And that even if those who are very close to us, very dear to us, are giving us definitions or confirming negative ones that we have, the truth is that your light shines through that darkness. Your truth shines through that deception. And that when we begin to believe the truth by faith, you begin to turn things around. And so, Father, I just would pray for all of us this morning. I just, I just pray over all of us that we somehow by your, your grace would be able to have that little bit of faith to believe what you say instead of what we think we know about ourselves, to look at how you define us instead of how we maybe have defined ourselves for years and years and years. And Lord, I thank you that sort of big picture, when you define us, the word that seems to come up is wonderful. You've created us in your image, and how you see us, regardless of everything, is wonderful. So Father, we thank you, we bless you this morning, and, uh, and we thank you for your, your truth and your goodness to us. We just uh, give the rest of this day to you and this week. Just pray a blessing over all of you here today that as you just live your life this week, you would encounter the love and the grace and the guidance of God. And we pray it all in the name of our Lord and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Amen.